Hi, this is Dr. Oshiemi, infectious disease specialist from Triple Medical Services. I'm here to discuss COVID-19 pandemic. This year has been extremely, extremely stressful for everyone. I hope what I'm about to talk about today will alleviate some of those fears. And my talk today will be focused mostly on vaccine, but I'll give you some background before I dive into the uh, contents of the vaccine talk. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to high mobility and mortality, and in fact, it's affected a lot of people uh, in terms of financial crisis. People have lost jobs. Uh, some people have become homeless. There are businesses that are closed as a result of a pandemic. There are also psychosocial impact of this disease, or this pandemic, so to speak. Uh, so many people are anxious, uh, people are depressed, uh, some folks have not been able to see their family members, and that's affected how we socialize in the society. And even the children and young adults that had to go to school have had to learn how to learn from a distant uh, perspective. And that's also affected their social skills and their interaction they are normally uh, engaging during this time of their life. And if one gets COVID, there are also possibilities of getting COVID-19 syndrome which can persist for months. And some of those symptoms could include fatigue, chest pressure, and, and just sheer shortness of breath. So, so there's so many things that happen when you have uh, COVID-19. Uh, so how do we fix this? So we have to have some kind of comprehensive intervention. And that intervention includes treatment. Uh, and there are several treatment uh, opportunities out there, <clears throat> one of which is an antiviral therapy namely remdesivir. This drug has been approved, but only in patients who are in the hospital. You also have another drug, which is a steroid called Decadron, that, that's also useful when patients are in the hospital with apoxia, meaning shortness of breath. There are new therapies that are just evolving, which are the monoclonal antibodies. There are two that are currently uh, approved under emergency authorization. Um, <clears throat> one is by Eli Lilly, and the other one is by Regeneron, as listed here. Uh, the same monoclonal antibody can also be used as a prophylaxis uh, therapy for individuals who, are, who live in the same household as, as someone who has COVID-19, so that we can try to prevent or reduce the symptoms. So this study is still ongoing, so we'll have more data in the next few months. Then you have the class of drugs that are called the immunomodulators. And, and the goal of these drugs is really to, to intervene or diminish that chemokine storm that people get when, when you have COVID-19. Those chemokine storm is what leads to severe lung disease and, and, and respiratory failure and, and, and people dying. So if you can intervene with these molecules, we can hopefully uh, diminish or reduce the prog or prevent progression to this end stage uh, 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 disease. Uh, NIH and some other companies uh, you know, have, have studied some of these molecules, some of which were uh, part of. Uh, then there's this prevention approach, which is the vaccine. There are multiple companies out there working on different vaccines. And, and this is what we think will be the really the, the some of the platform that will really end this pandemic. Well, people have so, many, so much fear when it comes to vaccine. Uh, is it safe? Is it the right approach to go, uh, to go through? So, so these are some of the questions people have surrounding the vaccine. Is this vaccine safe? How effective is the vaccine? Are there side effects? Uh, can I get a vaccine if I'm immunocompromised, if I have blue pulse, if I have rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, is there a microchip in the vaccine? Uh, is the government going to be tracking me when I take this vaccine? Uh, what does the vaccine do does to my DNA? Is it going to change my DNA, turn me into an alien of some sort? Uh, this vaccine is new and it, it's made too quickly, so then I'm going to wait to see what happens. Uh, can I infect somebody else after I get vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine? So these are some of the fears, some of the concerns that uh, people are bringing up to, to, to me anyway. And I'm, I'm hoping after this conversation, I can actually help resolve or answer these questions. So what is vaccine? Uh, CDC defined a vaccine as one that stimulates the immune system to produce antibodies 
exactly like if you were exposed to the disease. So after you get vaccinated, you can develop immunity to that disease without having to get the disease first. Webster has a definition. It's a preparation of killed microorganisms or life-weakened organisms or living fully virulent organisms that's administered to produce or artificially increase immunity to a particular disease. Now, how does the vaccine work anyway? Uh, the immune system really you know, is designed to protect uh, us from pathog pathogens, uh, which are agents that cause the disease, cause the disease. So a vaccine is like a patho pathogen imposter. It looks like a certain bacteria or virus, so the immune system can you know, develop a uh, response to it and without us getting sick from the vaccine. That's, it. That's really what vaccine does. And pathogens in general are covered by molecules that are called antigen on the surface. And those molecules tend to trigger the immune response. And so the vaccine exposes the body to antigens that are similar to those things on the pathogen itself. And by doing that, we're basically tricking the immune system to produce that immunity. So vaccination programs are two different responses, you see. The vaccination really gives you that primary response where you expose the immune system to a, a weakened or killed version of the pathogen to induce immune response. So your immune response becomes very prime. So when you actually get exposed to a real pathogen, uh, they just come out full blast and, and kill that pathogen. So this is a depiction of what, how, how a vaccine actually works. So you, you receive a vaccine, so that vaccine will contain a part of the virus or bacteria. So there are cells inside your body that are called antigen-presenting cells. They will kind of take, pick up those antigens and they move to the lymph node where they present that information to t alpha cell. The T alpha cell will then take those same pathogen and show it to the naive B cells or naive T uh, killer T cells. Those cells mean they haven't seen that pathogen before. So as they process the information, the naive B cell then transform into plasma B cells and start making antibodies and then destroying those pathogens that just enter the body from the vaccine. In doing so, now that B cell remembers now it forms memory cells, memory B cells. So anytime you not get exposed to that pathogen, those B cells will remember that, ah, we've seen this before, let's engage. Now, on the other side of it, where the T cell, the killer T cell remembers, it gets activated, it kills any infected cells that were invaded by those vaccines. But also it becomes, a, it transforms to memory T cell, so it remembers Next time it sees any cell that's infected, it's going to gobble up that infected cell. So how are vaccines produced? We know how it works. How do you pro produce them? So there are several ways. I've made into four different groups. Uh, one is the attenu attenuated or weakened virus. Uh, so it's, it's, the other one is inactivated virus or killed virus. And then you have using components of the virus or bacteria to make vaccines. And then the last uh, category is the, using the genetic uh, information or code to uh, induce vaccine or immune system. We're gonna go through each one of those. So this is an example. How long, how long does it take to make a vaccine? It could take years in some scenario. On the left side, on my left side, which may be on your right side, it looks like an egg. That's the viral way of making things. That's the way of making viral pathogens or vaccine. On the other side, where you see plate is how you make vaccines against bacteria. So you have a pathogen, whether a virus or bacteria, and you have the antigen on the surface, and you need to make that. To make that, you have to actually grow the cell, grow the, back, the pathogen. And you have to find a, a, a medium where you can grow that. So you may know you have a disease, you find out what causes the disease, you have to find a medium, a way where you can grow that, that bacteria or virus. And that could take some time, take months to figure out the best way to grow that in a large quantity. Once you grow that in large quantities, then you have to isolate those, those things that induce the immune system, which are the, the uh, protein on the surface of the virus or the bacteria. Once you then isolate that, 
you have to remember that's not pure. It's got components of the virus or bacteria or some other things in there. You have to kind of purify that. Again, that's a process. After you're done with that, you then have to see how you can, again, uh, really take the, the best possible purified material from all that. And once you get that, you may have to add additional component of protein to that, to that antigen to make it better induce immune system. Because some antigens don't in, in, in induce pathogen very well, such as the polysaccharide for children, for example. So you have to add an adjuvant, work kind on of adjuvant to help induce the immune system. So this takes a lot of time to produce. And then once you do that, when you have that purified form, then you have to put in this large vessel uh, to really try and make, you know, to make a lot of it. Once you make a lot of it, then you have to individually put in the small valves and then package it, get into a big truck, and then get your destination. So this takes, can take a lot of time. And this is what we are used to seeing. So this expectation in vaccine takes quite a long time. Now, we're going to now go back and break it down to those different four categories. So the life attenuated vaccines are really uh, vaccines that are weakened. So they're live virus or bacteria. You kind of weaken them. One way of doing it is to take a virus, for example, and you make them go through repeated um, cell cultures. And over time, you have some of them that become very weak, that can't really replicate effectively. And you isolate that, and you're trying to make that into a vaccine. But this picture looks so simple, but the time it actually takes from one point to the other, it takes quite a while. An example of those would be uh, measles, uh, the MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella. This is how we make that. Uh, rotavirus, uh, influenza uh, vaccine that's through the nose, that's a live asymptomatic virus. So this kind of virus, because they're alive, even though they're weakened, we can't really give it to, to people who are, uh, are immunocompromised. But they tend to work very well. They induce a lifelong immunity. Um, but because they're life attenuated, they don't, again, they, they, they don't divide as rapidly as a natural uh, uh, pathogen, but they're very effective. Then another category is the inactivated vaccines. These are, the, these are viruses or bacteria that you actually kill, either by chemical or by heat. And then once you kill that, then it can turn into a vaccine. So these tend to also induce good immune response, except because they are killed by vaccine. They are not, the response is not as great as the life attenuated. Example of this type of vaccines are polio, hepatitis A, influenza, uh, the one you give by the intramuscular injection, and rabies. The advantage is, again, this cannot cause a mild form of the disease because they're dead uh, pathogen, but it can be given to people who have a weakened immune system. The disadvantage is, is you have to give multiple doses uh, to achieve their immunity. For COVID-19, uh, one of the companies in China is actually trying to make a vaccine using this approach. Uh, sometimes we talk about va vaccine, mRNA, mRNA, we have to keep in mind that other companies are making the same, making COVID-19 by other method. The reason why these are not in the front front because it takes longer to make it that way. Then you have your subunit or conjugate vaccine where you take a piece of that virus or bacteria, it could be those, so, those the proteins on the surface of the, of the bacteria or virus, and you try to make it, like I discussed before, it takes time to get to that, to that point where you grow the bacteria and virus, you isolate the, stuff, uh, the protein on the surface, you try to purify it, make a lot of it, then use adjuvant or no adjuvant in some scenario, and then the vaccine final product. So it takes time. Examples of this are hepatitis B vaccine, shingles, or HPV, that's human papilloma virus. Uh, Again, this is a portion of the, this is a piece of the protein on the surface of the pathogen or the virus in this scenario that we introduce into the body. The body responds to it by creating antibodies, and that's how immunity develops. Uh, typically, you, you know, we need usually two doses before we can induce that uh, immunity. COVID-19 is another vaccine that's been looked at uh, using this method. Uh, there are several companies using this approach. 
Sanofi and GSK are working together to create a protein-based approach. Then there's also no, Nova, Nova, Novavax. It's also working on the vaccine using this approach. Again, it's taking longer on like the mRNA, mRNA because the process required is more complex, but they are coming. Then the subunit conjugate vaccine, again, I'm just gonna give an example here. For pneumonia vaccine for adults, we use the polysaccharide, which is the sugar, or sugar um, components on the surface of the uh, bacteria to make vaccine. But children don't usually respond to sugar-like uh, uh, vaccines, so we have to add a protein to it to induce a better response. So in children, the same vaccine will be called a conjugate vaccine, whereby we add a harmless protein to the polysaccharide. And examples are the Haemophilus uh, type B, pneumococcal vaccine, and the meningococcal vaccine in children. Then finally, we go down to the gene-based vaccine, which is what we're talking about uh, these days, the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. It's, it's really three ways of doing it. One is the mRNA. mRNA is basically messenger RNA that codes, is, is a code for that protein. So it's what really tells you, how, you know, how to make the protein. And so once we give that uh, protein to someone, well, in this scenario, what we do is we inject the mRNA into, into someone, and then that, that body, the, the, the host, where the, the person who, who received that vaccine, would then use that mRNA to develop the, the protein, and then the antibodies develop as a result. So I'll give you more details as we go along. The second one is the DNA. DNA, is, it, there's no commercial, commercially available DNA vaccine right now. Uh, but that's another approach to, to make vaccine. These are our codes to make that surface protein that we talk about. Then you have the viral vector where you actually put the DNA that codes for the same thing we're talking about and put inside a, a harmless virus and use as a vaccine. We'll talk more in details. This is a picture of this gene-based therapy. So if you look on your right, where you see the mRNA, so the mRNA for COVID-19 specifically, that mRNA codes for the spike protein on the, on the COVID-19, on the SARS virus. So what we do is we'll, we'll have the mRNA that codes for that spike protein, we'll put inside a little fatty envelope called a, nano, it's a nanoparticle, it's like a little lipid droplet. We'll then, that's how the vaccine is made. We inject that into the human being, into the muscle. That mRNA does not get inside the nucleus of, the, of, of your cell. It stays outside of it, in what we call cytoplasm. And basically, it just binds what we call ribosomes, or the big building block, and just make that spike protein. And as soon as those spike proteins are made, they come to the surface of the muscle where you get injection. And then your body responds to it, you say, ah, this is something foreign. The, the antigen presenting cells go grab it, take the lymph node, you know, and they, where the T-lymphocytes and B-lymphocytes are, and then process it, make antibodies, make memory cells, like we talked about before. That's the mRNA vir vaccine approach. So the idea that the mRNA changes your DNA is not true because it doesn't get into your nucleus. It doesn't go there at all. The other approach, which is DNA, where you should take the DNA that also carries the same message for the uh, spike protein in this scenario for COVID-19, what the, when you put that DNA, that code inside, a, uh, uh, for example, adenovirus that's not capable of replicating, you put it inside it so it becomes a vector, and then you inject that into someone. Now that DNA goes into your into your nucleus, but it does interact with your genetic uh, information. As soon as it gets into the nucleus, it just basically takes the DNA for that spike protein, turns into an mRNA. And the mRNA just goes out the cytoplasm, again, interacts with the, the building block of the ribosome and makes those uh, spike protein and goes outside and then immediately develops. So there is no real interaction here with your host DNA. So the time to production, the time you said to make, to make RNA vaccine is really shorter because of several things. One, there's been several Coronavirus, uh, uh, coronaviruses that we've dealt with over the last few years, including MERS, 
SARS-CoV-1. Uh, so we've had some experience with this. And in terms of RNA, RNA vaccine, we've actually done some preliminary, uh, some initial work with uh, Zika virus. Well, we've been working on making a vaccine for Zika. So we, Moderna, actually it was done by Moderna. So they've had some experience in how to make RNA vaccine. So when COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 came along, they're just using the same platform of what they had for Zika to make one for this uh, virus. So the, the code for the virus came out very quickly in China when it came out. The, that came, once we know the code for the, for the spike protein, uh, it was easy to make the mRNA. And once you make the mRNA, it's like, okay, let's make it into a little, into a little uh, nanoparticle, a little lipid, uh, lipid uh, droplet, because you need that lipid environment to get into the cell, and the mRNA will not survive around on the surface by itself. You need to protect it. So that's how this came about, along with, the, again, the, the collaboration globally amongst the researchers and the funding uh, by the federal government. So there was a lot of effort. Things, even in the research world, sometimes it takes us like three months, two months to get contracts done, get uh, you know, approval to get the study going. I mean, we get things done now in a week, in two weeks, because there's so much uh, effort in getting things done quickly. So this, nothing really get, I mean, the process didn't change. It's just that it was done quickly based on the previous knowledge and based on the better collaboration and the funding. Now, so this antigen, I think I've kind of de described this already. People say, oh, there's chips in, you know, inserted in the vaccine. There's no chips in the vaccine. And this is pretty much mRNA based on what we know. Now, we're going to talk specifically about, about Moderna vaccine now. Uh, they basically, their goal was to see how to, uh, to determine if uh, their, their, their vaccine is efficacious in preventing COVID-19 and how safe is the vaccine. So the FDA actually gave everybody a guideline to say, well, can you prevent COVID-19 infection two months after your second dose of the vaccination? If you can, then we'll give you emergency authorization use. And that's what's happened right now. But those same patients are being followed over the next two years to determine if that immunity lasts that long or do we need to give people booster. So that information is ongoing. The Moderna vaccine, in their trial, they had about 63% were whites, 20% were Hispanic or Latin, Latino, 10% blacks, and 4% Asians. Um, by and large, the risk factors that you saw in that population of patients, 36% uh, of those patients had diabetes mellitus, 25% uh, had severe obesity, 19% had significant cardiac disease, 18% had chronic lung disease. Why is this important? These are, the, these are the patients that are more at risk of developing a severe uh, COVID infection. So that's why it's important to include them in the study. Now, about 25% of the patients in the study were 65 years of age and or older. And about 39% were between the age of 45 and 64, and 29% were between the age of 25 and 44. That's also important to see how well do, you know, does uh, do older people, uh, older patients behave compared to younger patients? So the the medication comes in a vial. There are ten doses inside each vial, and each patient will receive 100 micrograms uh, each time times two doses with tw uh, 28 days apart. Um, the vaccine efficacy is 94 percent. So that means that there's uh, there's 94 percent chance of you not getting COVID with this vaccine. The, if you break the, break the efficacy down based on age group, so people who are younger, between the age of 18 and 65, the efficacy is about 95.8. For older uh, patients over the, at least 65 years of age, the efficacy is 86.4%, is, uh, which is very good. There are obviously adverse events with anything that you get. Um, for Moderna vaccine, it's no exception. Um, some of those side effects include injection site pain, fatigue, headache, myalgia, use of uh, antipyretic agents for fever. Uh, there's also axillary swelling. 
If I remember, I, I mentioned that when you get, get your vaccine, the antigen presenting cells will go grab those antigens or the protein and then take the lymph node. So it's not unusual sometimes to get patients who get, get swollen lymph node in the axillary close to where they get the injection because it's the, it's, it's, it's the determinant of the, it just shows how robust the response would be, the vaccine uh, uh, elicit uh, immune response. If it's very robust, sometimes people have increased lymph node at the site of the injection. And usually it takes about 10 days, it'll go away. Some people have nausea, some can have a little uh, rash, but again, the different, is, uh, the, we, we may see more and more, uh, we may see more uh, adverse events as, we, as more population gets the medication, but so far, it seems like this, the adverse events seem to be a little worse than the, that of the flu. However, most of the side effects last a day or two, and they resolve. Um, so it, it's not a prolonged side effect if you do get one. Now, people are immunocompromised. I worry, well, should I get this vaccine? Well, there's no contraindication to getting the vaccine. The only issue is they may have diminished uh, immune response because they're immunocompromised. Uh, allergic reaction can happen with any vaccine. Again, uh, Moderna COVID vaccine is no exception. Uh, if you have a reaction, we, we treat that reaction. Now, if your reaction is mild, such as a rash or fever, but you know, rash, that's something you can treat uh, with Benadryl. However, if you have a situation where we have to give that patient epinephrine or send to the hospital, then they should not get a second dose of that vaccine. People who have a history of severe allergy to vaccine should also consult a doctor and decide whether to get the vaccine or not. However, if you have a severe allergy to food, pets, or latex, there's no contraindication to not getting the vaccine. Uh, for pregnant women, uh, there's not enough uh, data to inform the risk to, of pregnancy. However, in, in rats, there's no teratogenicity found in them. Um, there are, if a patient decides to enroll, in, uh, get a vaccine, they should enroll in the registry uh, so we can capture that data. Uh, there's, uh, Pfizer is looking to do research on pregnant women and their COVID-19 vaccine, which will be part of uh, shortly. There's no data when it comes to lactation um, at this time. Now, we'll kind of switch gear to the Pfizer vaccine as a collaboration between Pfizer and BioNTech. And they they have a name for their vaccine now, Toxinameram. Um, it's an mRNA vaccine, again, that codes for the S spike protein on the surface of the virus. Uh, this is a very busy slide, but it's not intended to confuse or make you dizzy, but the idea is about 43 uh, thousand people were involved in a clinical trial, and uh, about 50% were female, and 48% uh, were female, 51% uh, were male, 49% were about female. This is almost similar to the Moderna uh, demographic. Again, about um, here about 10%, 9% were black, and the Moderna is like 10%. So, so really the distribution is about the same. These are just local side reaction and systemic side reaction. So on the left, uh, you see the uh, local uh, side reaction, which includes uh, uh, things like uh, uh, pain at the injection site, redness, and swelling. Uh, obviously, they're small. Uh, just look at reaction with, with the vaccine versus placebo. On the right, uh, other side effects that's more systemic could be fever, fatigue, um, headache, chills, vomiting, diarrhea. Again, there tend to be more of those. Uh, what we see more of the fatigue, headache, uh, muscle, muscle pain are more, are more common than the other side effects. Now, how efficacious is this vaccine? Well, if you look at seven days after the second dose of the vaccine, uh, only eight, eight cases of COVID were found in people who received the vaccine versus 162 cases in people who received the placebo. 
Um, some of those patients who entered the study had COVID prior to entering the study, a small number. About 36,523 did not have COVID prior to getting the vaccine. And about roughly 4,000 people or less, about 4,000 people had COVID before they came on to get the vaccine. So you can clearly see that getting the vaccine does protect you from getting COVID because it is going to come with 95% protection uh, given the number of cases that you saw with people who did not receive the uh, vaccine. And you can actually, Pfizer actually broke this down to different age groups to see, well, how was the protection among different age groups, among the sex or even uh, ethnic background. And it's pretty much all in the 90s. Uh, in fact, 100, it seemed to work better in the people at 90, uh, 75 years and, and older. Uh, if you go back to the Moderna, it looks like the people are older when the 86 percentile. Uh, but for Pfizer, it seems to be very high. It seems to be the same across the board. Whether you're young or older, everybody seems to do, you know, about, respond about the same. And here is a very interesting slide. If you look at time zero when you receive the vaccine or placebo, after about 12 days, you start to see a difference in the incidence of COVID in between the placebo and the, and the vaccine. So if you have placebo, the number of COVID, if you're in a placebo arm, the number of COVID cases start to go up rapidly after, the, after 12 days. On the average, the incubation period is about five days for COVID. Then seven days beyond that, you start to see that, that, that divergence. And that's how the first dose. The second dose is given on day 20, 21. So even before the second dose, you can see the you can see that the the there's a difference between vaccine arm and placebo. So when you look at that data, at the first dose, there was 50%, at least 50% protection from getting uh, the vaccine. I believe, yeah, okay. So this is basically what I just mentioned. So uh, between the first and second dose, the you already have efficacy from your vaccine. You have 52% protection. After your second, within, after your second dose, between the first, within the first seven days after your second dose, that protection goes up to 91%. And if you look at between the first dose and second dose, there were 10 cases of severe COVID. And of those 10 cases, one was in the vaccine arm, nine was in the placebo. So what this study also shows is that not only does this vaccine protect you from getting COVID, it also protects you from getting severe COVID. Uh, in the Moderna arm, they just also show some data, which I don't have on this slide, that suggests that Moderna vaccine also protects you against asymptomatic COVID infection. These are very important because that means if you get the, the, the vaccine, you're less likely to transmit, uh, pick up a virus and transmit to somebody else. Now, there were also adverse events noted in the Pfizer vaccine trial. Um, but it, it, it seems to be like the, the, the younger individuals between the 60 and 55 years of age tend to have more reaction than people who are at the age of 55. Uh, but the reaction tends to be transient, tend to result within a day or two, except for the lymphadenopathy that I mentioned before, it can take up to 10 days to resolve, but up to 10 days, could resolve sooner than that. And the serious adverse events were similar between the vaccine and the placebo. So now we talk about the mRNA. Now we're going to shift here to the DNA based uh, adenovirus. So basically, you're taking the DNA that codes for that spike protein and you put it into an adenovirus as a vector, and then you, you, you inject it into, into someone, and then that, that virus then you know, read that DNA and turn to mRNA and then make the spike protein, and then your body makes the immune system to it. So there are several companies that use that approach. The Russian vaccine that had efficacy of over 90% used that approach. AstraZeneca is, is also using that approach, and Johnson & Johnson. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, I think their efficacy is in about 70, 65, 70%. Uh, the, G, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine still, uh, they're not finished yet, it's still ongoing, study's still ongoing. 
And going to the back to that uh, uh, drawing or the, uh, the, the cartoon, you can see that DNA that I talked about. So you take the DNA for that that protein and surface of the virus. You insert that into the, the adenovirus that's not able to replicate. You weaken it. You turn it inactivated that, and you put it into the, to, the, to that virus, and you make a vaccine out of it, and you inject, and then that DNA again translate. I mean transcribe to uh, mRNA, and the mRNA translate to spike protein, and your body produces immune system to it. So, having given all this information, there is still a limited amount of vaccine out there. Because of that limited supply, we have to kind of strategize and who gets it first. Obviously, the frontliners, such as the healthcare providers, are the ones that get it first, and then that kind of filtered down to other, other individuals, including vulnerable population. As more and more vaccine becomes available, the goal is to give the vaccine to everyone, uh, at least offer it to everyone, and in order to achieve the herd immunity you, you, you hear about. What does that really mean? Well, if you take a population that's never been exposed to uh, a pathogen, if I introduce a pathogen to this population, especially a pathogen that can be spread person to person, this will just spread like Wi-Fi. But if you give vaccine to some of that population, you give enough vaccine to it, if you get vaccine to enough people, it then becomes difficult for the virus to jump from one person to another because of that vaccination. And that's what we talk about the herd immunity. And that number changes from infection to infection. It could be 50% in some scenario, it could be 70% in another scenario. So that's why it's very important to make sure we enough people get vaccinated. Now, there are special, special situations we have to kind of talk about briefly. Patients who, had, who have had COVID-19 naturally, can they get the vaccine? Yes, they can. Uh, now, on one condition. So if that individual was not given monoclonal antibody, they can get the vaccine right away. But if they were given monoclonal antibody, they had to wait 90 days from the time they were given that monoclonal antibody before they can get the vaccine because it takes about 90 days to clear that monoclonal antibody from your system. And if you don't wait, that monoclonal antibody could actually affect the response to the vaccine. So we don't want that to be the case. We also know that the monoclonal antibody will pr protect you for at least 90 days. We know people who are in the study did not get COVID-19 during that 90-day period. Uh, also, there are some groups that receive prophylaxis with the monoclonal antibody. Those patients also should wait 90 days because of the interference between the monoclonal antibody and the, and the vaccine. And lastly, uh, the pregnancy. Again, the re CDC recommend for the pregnant women uh, to talk to their doctor and, and look at the pros and cons and about getting the vaccine. Uh, there's a clinical trial about, that's about to start looking at the COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer in pregnant population. How long does the immunity last? Once you get your vaccine, is this protecting you for life? But we don't have that data yet. Remember, COVID, this SARS-CoV-2 just came out, just became a problem this year. And so the vaccine trial just ended about three months ago. Well, not ended, but we have data looking uh, two months post second dose of the vaccine. It's gonna take time to see what will happen up to two years down the road. So we can't really tell you that what will happen you know, six months after you get the vaccine. We do know so far that you know, the, the protection can last as long as at least three months, uh, based on what we know so far. Uh, so we gave more and more data, we'll kind of talk about it. Uh, and and some, pay, some individuals actually have a natural infection. Uh, we know the level of antibody decreases over time. Some, some of those folks, Recent study from coming out of the UK suggests up to six months people still have good antibody, uh, interest antibody levels. So the, that data is not continuing to evolve and we know more and more. Uh, in New England Journal of Medicine recently, they looked at about 34 patients who received COVID-19 vaccine to see how well the neutralizing antibody uh, is maintained over time. So there's not enough time to really uh, know what this study means since it's a small population. However, it is a signal that indeed uh, people may lose, uh, may, may have decrease in the antibody levels. However, this may not be the only thing uh, that, we, that, that drives immunity because remember you have the B 
uh, memory B cells and memory T cells. Uh, even after given the vaccine, the neutralized antibody level may drop over time because there is no virus around. So once you get to release the virus, those memory cells and T cells could trigger production of more uh, or increase the level of antibody in your, in your system. So there's more data. We need to learn more about this uh, response, system, uh, immune response. Uh, so I, I don't think a lot of us don't think antibody alone is is a, is a measure of your of your response to this virus. That you it's going to be probably a combination of the, the antibodies and the T cells and, and B cells. So. Let's go back to the questions we asked at the beginning. Is this vaccine safe? Well, we've proven that with the study that the vaccine is safe. We've also proven that the vaccine is very effective. Uh, when you think about the efficacy of the vaccine in the 90s, that's very great. I mean, that's great. Uh, when you look at influ influenza, it's by 40 to 50%. Uh, so this, this, this COVID vac vaccine that we have now has shown it's very effective, and that's also shown to be very safe. Yes, adverse events, of course there's adverse events. That can be seen in any vaccine you get. Uh, but most of the adverse events that are found, that are seen in this study, are short-lived, they last one or two days. Um, people who are immune, immune uh, uh, compromised can get the vaccine. They just may not respond as well. Um, and there's no microchip in the vaccine. I already showed you how the vaccine is made. There's no way to put a chip in that. Uh, does the vaccine change your DNA? We talked about it. The MRA doesn't get into your nucleus, so it doesn't even touch your DNA. So there's no way that would change your DNA. Uh, the vaccine is new, is new. It was made too quickly. Well, it wasn't made quickly. It was, it was not necessarily. I think it was made on time. I think it was new, yes. Uh, but the, 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 we already have information on how to make vaccines uh, as this. We already know, familiar with the coronavirus fam family. So we had an advantage. And so it was, and we put a lot of effort and money into it to make this happen quickly, uh, on time. Now I'm open for any questions. Okay, so we got a couple of questions. This the first question again. I heard with COVID that the immune system sometimes goes into massive overdrive and causes a lot of the actual deadlier symptoms, the over-inflammatory reaction, et cetera. So if the vaccine tricks the immune system into getting in, into, into gear to fight this, why doesn't it have the same overdrive response? All right, so the question, the, I, I think I understand what the question is. The, when, when one gets COVID-19 infection, uh, it can, it can lead to a uh, chemokine storm release where people get very sick very quickly and they can progress into respiratory failure. Now, you don't get the same response with vaccine. Uh, keep in mind that with the vaccine, you're only using a component of the virus as opposed to the old virus. So we, we, so far through the vaccine experience, we don't think and we haven't seen uh, that kind of response that you get with natural infection. So we don't think you're ever gonna get that. There can be some robust response to the vaccine. And that's where you see that, that lymph node in your axilla get a little swollen and tender. That's the most that we've seen. So we don't expect to see that severe chemokine release that leads to re respiratory uh, lung disease in, in natural infection. Do you think the vaccine is really effective on the new UK variants, or is it just hopeful? I guess some of the experts, uh, guess some of the expert part of so so far. So yeah. So the question is: Is the new is the uh, vaccine effective against the the UK variant of COVID nineteen? Um, the the there is a little change, a little uh, change in genetic component of the spike protein on that UK variant. Uh, based on the initial analysis, it looks like all the vaccines so far, most all the vaccines are available are effective against it. So there's no reason to believe that we're gonna have any issue. Uh, that new variant is more contagious, about 70% more contagious, but it doesn't appear to lead to more death. Uh, 
Fortunately, sometimes when viruses or bacteria pick up an advantage by becoming more, more, um, more infective, sometimes they lose the ability to be more deadly. Uh, but I'm, I'm not saying this, the, uh, what I'm saying is this virus doesn't appear to cause more, more death, uh, even though it's more infectious, which is not a good thing, you know, because if this is more infectious, then that means you have more people get infected. So that's very worrisome. Uh, based on this new strain, do you envision any tweaking or updating of the vaccines? Um, so it would be best to wait, or does or do you see a booster type shot coming as well? I think there's no reason to wait uh, for the vaccine. I think again, there's no reason to believe uh, the change in the new strain is not such that it's going to affect the effectiveness of the vaccine. So I think that if you have the ability to get the vaccine out, get it. Uh, remember, this is not the only strain out there. Uh, so if there's any need to give a booster in the future, we will. But right now, I don't think there's a reason to do so because this vaccine should be effective based on what they've done in the initial analysis. Is the effects of the vaccine are known? If you had to guess, what would the negative long-term effects actually be? Um, i.e. if they've done RNA with Zika, et cetera, has there been long-term adverse effects since with uh, that vaccine research? Yeah, so the question is, what's the long-term side effects or potential side effects from the mRNA vaccine? Uh, we really don't have much information on this, uh, even with the Zika virus, we don't have much. So this is the first real licensed uh, mRNA vaccine uh, uh, that we have now, even though there's some experience with Zika a vaccine. Uh, there are theoretical uh, concerns. Well, could this mRNA vaccine continue to create or, or um, uh, create lead to some kind of autoimmune uh, disease or you know prolong uh, immune stimulation? Um, this is just theoretical uh, thinking, uh, but we don't think that will be the case. Um, based on all the short time data we've seen and the way this, the mechanism of action. Um, but more and more, again, the patients who are in this study already, um, we are collecting data from those folks. By next summer, we'll probably have a data for the effect, you know, long-term uh, effect over, you know, maybe nine months a year. So again, there's, these are theoretical concerns, but there's no real data suggesting that we expect to have any complication based on how this works. So the one, uh, since the Pfizer vaccine is more effective in older population, would be recommended for an 85 year old man to wait and try to get the Pfizer over the Moderna or not necessarily so? That's a great question. Uh, in, in the study that I presented, it looks like uh, the Pfizer vaccine was more effective in older population over 75 years of age. But I have to caution that in that, if you look at the number of patients who are 75 years and older, they were about 785. So the number, even though the percentage is higher, the number of patients in that age group were smaller. So this may not play out when you look at a larger population, meaning that if you look at a million people over the age of 75, so that number could drop a little bit. Having said that, I think that 86% versus, you know, 90, 95%, you know, for any vaccine, 86% is great. Uh, when, you, when you look at the efficacy of most vaccines. So I wouldn't wait uh, because if you were to wait a month, what happens if that individual 75 years old who is at risk for severe disease get, you know, natural COVID infection and, and don't survive. So I, I think the quicker you get the vaccine, the better you're protected. So there's some question about, uh, I'm trying to read the question here. So the, I guess the question is, what's the incidence of influenza infection this year? Uh, we really haven't seen that many cases of influenza because I think it's basically because people we were wearing masks and washing their hands and we kind of expected that. Uh, I, I was supposed to be doing a study uh, on influenza this year, testing people for influenza. And we did, we did a lot of testing on people who have cold-like symptoms. 
And we only saw maybe two cases uh, of influenza. Uh, even within the hospital, we haven't seen many cases at all. Uh, and I think the reason is that people are wearing a mask and people are washing their hands. So there's definitely uh, the impact of social distancing and, and where, uh, mask wearing has really reduced the amount of influenza cases we, we usually see. Uh, I guess the question is about a, a, there was a bill cell lymphoma in patient who received Moderna vaccine. Uh, I think that I don't think this has anything to do with the, the vaccine itself, uh, but there's going to be more data, uh, more information that's going to be shared on that uh, over the next few weeks. Another question is how do we know which vaccine to take? Um, really, uh, since the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine have about the same efficacy, 94 and 95%, uh, it doesn't really matter which one you take. Um, the, the AstraZeneca, the efficacy looks as about 70%. 70%. Uh, even with that, in some areas, that might be the only thing you, you, you have access to. I will still suggest you get it. So um, then you have Johnson & Johnson, which you know we don't have, more, it's not available yet. So, but in terms of Moderna and Pfizer, they're equally effective and there's no advantage about one or the other in terms of efficacy. Can we stop wearing masks after getting the vaccine? At this point, I would strongly recommend to keep wearing a mask because if you remember, um, you need to get enough people vaccinated to really protect other folks. Uh, so if not everybody, is, if you don't have enough people that's, that's vaccinated, you still wear a mask. Given the fact that the vaccine is 95% effective, that means there are 5% that may not respond to the vaccine. So if not enough people are vaccinated, then you may be at risk of getting uh, the infection. Um, I guess one question is asked is how can we get a copy of the slides? Um, I suppose you can reach out to myself, uh, send an email to Dr. Triple O at tripleomedical.com and uh, we can send you a copy. Uh, we're going to repost this webinar on, a, on our website also, uh, tripleomedical.com. Uh, Another question, do vitamins like, uh, do vitamins like B, I mean, vitamin C and B, C and D have impact on the virus? Um, well, we do give this, this, uh, these vitamins to people who are infected. However, um, it doesn't necessarily prevent you from getting this infection. So you can take vitamin C and D, if you don't wear your mask, you can, you can still get infection. So. I still strongly suggest social distance and wear your mask, uh, but we do give it uh, to some people once they get infected because their vitamin D sometimes can be low in patients who have COVID-19 infection. Um, yes, if you've had uh, COVID-19, can you get a vaccine? Yes, um, we recommend a couple of weeks after that, you recover, you, should get a, you can get a vaccine. Uh, there was a question about monoclonal antibodies. So what monoclonal antibodies, does, monoclonal antibodies bodies do is basically, um, you know, we can use it to treat or to prevent. Uh, that's, uh, so what they do is basically they bind the spike protein to neutralize them. So the Eli Lilly and the Regeneron created the monoclonal antibodies that actually have, that covers multiple strains. Uh, so when patients were infected, if, if given within the next, uh, with, within seven days of onset of symptoms or sometimes 10 days, you can reduce, uh, you can clear the virus quickly compared to placebo, and you can reduce the, the, the chance of that individual ending up in the hospital. So we know it's effective based on the initial data that we've analyzed, uh, and that's why this Monoclonal antibodies have been given emergency authorization. Uh, they neutralize the virus, but you've got to give it very quickly within the, the week of uh, onset of symptoms. Uh, one question I ask: What does it mean when you have when you catch COVID and you have uh, shots of glass in your lungs? 
uh, well, when you do get COVID infection, it does affect your lung. There's some typical appearance. Well, there are several appearances or se several ways uh, COVID can appear in your lungs. Uh, it can appear like just little interstitial, what we call interstitial presentation, or they can be, they can appear as a ground glass. Uh, it's just the way they look on the CAT scan and the X-ray. And it's not unique to COVID, other disease can have that same appearance. But over time, that should clear. However, in severe disease, uh, this can lead to scar tissue and those things can persist for weeks and months. But the goal is if you get COVID uh, is to, uh, again, call your doctor, call us right away so we can give you some advice as to what to do. More, some people will have COVID and they, have, they will have no symptoms. Others will have mild illness. You never know what's going to happen. So the sooner you give us a call, we can give you advice on what to do. Uh, if you are not short of breath, we can manage you as an outpatient. Uh, there are treatment options outpatient. But once your oxygen saturation drops below 94%, you should be in the hospital very quickly uh, because the sooner we can treat you, the better your outcome. Uh, people get COVID-19 sometimes, even after they recover from the COVID, meaning after the COVID resolve, they can have these prolonged symptoms of fatigue, uh, chest pressure. So the early intervention really is a key uh, to this, uh, to management of this disease. All right, Dr. Johnson. Yes. Uh, I don't okay. think you often see me, but I did. I did want to say a couple of things because uh, I so I think it's so important. <clears throat> Yesterday, I had the opportunity to treat a 65-year-old cancer survivor in the last five years uh, with with uh, heavy chemotherapy who also developed CLL and was at a family gathering last week and started to show COVID symptoms the first of this week. So very fast, started to show COVID symptoms. And his oncologist, as well as his doctor said, well, there's really nothing we can do. They more or less were very skeptical of him going to a party, but that's ex post facto. But also they told him there was nothing they could do because he would have to meet certain criteria to do anything else. Well, this is a 65 year old man with cancer or a history of cancer and with CLL, which is a, an immune uh, modulator for sure. So his immune system was off. Um, I was able to work it so that we could get him diagnosed because he had already had a, a negative test, get him diagnosed yesterday and get the Lilly monoclonal antibody in him and he was sent back home by early afternoon. About uh, this, these monoclonal antibodies seem to reduce hospitalization by 70% if used in the viral proliferation phase. If you wait to the cytokine, cytokine storm phase or so-called pulmonary phase, they don't work as well. And in fact, if the patients are hospitalized, it's actually contraindicated. 80% of these monoclonal antibodies are sitting on the shelves. I have a feeling they're preserved or reserved for certain people. You've got to be aware of them and be an advocate for your patients to get them when they're in high risk categories, certain ones, because some of these places have them, but they will not seek that emergency use, author, use authorization unless someone is an advocate for that patient. This guy would have slipped totally through the cracks. And I can tell you very reputable doctors that he had that were not willing to be advocates. I don't know if they're tired or what, but I think it's important for everyone to know there are medications if you get diagnosed early and get these things in you, they greatly reduce your chances of going into the hospital. And as uh, people of color and with all these comorbidities, they need to know about this and someone needs to get these things in them. 
Thank you so much for, for that information, Dr. Johnston. Um, I can tell you right now that I've been doing clinical trials on COVID since March. And we've been using the monoclonal antibody since then. And uh, people of color haven't really stepped up to access this medication. Other groups have access this medication. In the clinical trial, you have 75% chance of getting these monoclonal antibodies. And we've been, you know, this patient I monitor very, very closely, and no, none of these patients have ended up in the hospital. In addition to that, we now have access to the emergency use uh, either a little drug, which we'll have in our possession on Monday. Uh, so we've been trying to reach out to everyone out there that we can treat people, even as an outpatient, we have remdesivir that we can give IV and, and, and nebulizer approach. We've had access to NIH uh, drug studies here. So we've been trying to push this information out to people. And they're not, they're not getting, we're not, I mean, we're getting people coming in from Miami, from Port St. Lucie, from, you know, but our people who live locally are not accessing these drugs, are not accessing this information. So even though some of our doctors are, are reluctant, they're not well informed as to, as to the, the, the utility of these drugs. And, and they are not encouraging their patients to access them. So the information, uh, the education goes beyond just the patient. It, it goes, has to go towards the doctors too, because if the doctors are not uh, well informed, they're not gonna, they're not gonna help their patient. Um, you're right, there's, there's, there's a politics behind all this. Uh, for us to even get that medication, uh, we have to go to who's called the health department called the hospital that have access to this drug and finally end up calling the operation warp speed in, in DC to finally get a hand on some doses this Monday. And so now we're in the loop uh, so of getting it. So for us, if a patient come to us, they have access through emergency authorization or through research. And so they will get something. I mean, so they just have to call us if, they, if they're sick, but they need to call us as soon as they're sick, no wait. Till, like you said, to the, you know, the point where the drug doesn't work as well. Thank you so much, and I consider you a valuable resource. Thank you. Thank you so much. Which one? Should babies get vaccine? Uh, they, we don't have enough data to to recommend vaccine in, in children. There are ongoing. Uh, studies in, in children less than 16 years of age. Uh, once that study is completed, we'll be able to say uh, yay or nay. But right now, the vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine is approved for 16 years and older, the Moderna 18 years and older, but the data for children are coming. So the question is, is there any pros or, or con uh, to having vaccine with two doses versus one? Uh, there is none. Um, the only, well, I guess there could be one. So if you get uh, in a two-dose vaccine, if you only receive one and you, you don't receive the second one, then you don't get the full effect of the vaccine. Uh, so for folks who think, well, I'm not going to come back for my second vaccine, then you may want to get the one for the, the, the one vaccine uh, 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 by Johnson & Johnson. However, this, this is not available yet. So I want to recommend you wait until that's available. And in fact, Johnson & Johnson is looking to do the same study using two doses. So there may well be that, even though now we think one dose will be, will be the answer, it may well be that Johnson & Johnson may end up in two, two uh, uh, doses also. Do paper mask protect you? Um, there are differences between masks. Um, there are masks who, um, there, are, there are masks that are three layers, two layers. The, the, obviously the three layers more protective than two layers. But any kind of barrier between you and the outside wall offer you some protection. Uh, so, uh, but obviously the, the difference protection you get between the type of mask you wear. All right, thank you so much everyone for attending. And again, we'll post this on the website. And um, if you have any questions, you can reach us at 561-832-6770. Uh, thank you.